What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip. You're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. And this is the number one ideological resource where you're going to get the goods from the academy, be it scholars of religion, philosophers, scientists, and such. But today, you're getting to hear from atheist evolutionary uh, philosopher, uh, a man invested in the philosophy of science, the life and work of Charles Darwin, and a committed uh, committed member of the larger conversation of religion and science, professor from Florida State University, Michael Roos. Oh, yeah. And this is a doozy. He is the author of a ton of books, um, including Darwinism as Religion, On Purpose, The Problem of War, A Meaning to Life. And over the course of the conversation, uh, you're going to hear not only his story as someone who comes out of a Quaker experience of faith that they value and treasured and then moved into becoming an atheist, but someone who in that atheist space, as someone who is is fascinated and awed by the work of Darwin and the continued uh, growth and understanding in evolutionary science, he's also still invested in the questions and wrestling with them anew um, from uh, from his new perspective that that, that means he's a different type of conversation partner in religion and science space. Uh, he's friends with lots of people of faith um, and regularly engages them um, as an atheist and is an outspoken critic of the new atheist. Uh, and and in, in fact, in, the, in this interview, he'll say that the new atheists are very much in the religious business. Uh, and, and that's actually a problem, he sees. So uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation and hear all... Uh, the different ways uh, that, that Dr. Roos takes the questions humanity has continued to ask and been expressed in different ways in our wisdom and religious traditions and looks at them anew from a scientific uh, perspective without the presence of an ultimate reality. Anyway, real treat, real treat. Before we hop in, I also want to just invite everyone uh, over to go check out the new website, you can go to tripfuller.com with two Ps. Trip with two Ps. It's like falling over, you know, like you trip, but with two Ps. Tripfuller.com. Check it out. We got a whole bunch of new stuff we're going to be putting up there. And um, also, if you want to join our reading group going on right now, it is the Open and Relational Theology Reading Group. Uh, you can go to openandrelationaltheology.com. Find out about all the exciting readings we're having. I'm doing it with Thomas J. Ord, uh, philosopher, scholar of religion. And uh, yeah, we're having a great time in the group. You'll get all the sessions we've already done, all the ones coming up, the readings and all that kind of stuff. You join openandrelationaltheology.com. And the cool part is, the cool part is, it's pay whatever you can. So, you know, you can give a million dollars because you love the podcast and want to contribute or zero. Really, we just want to engage in some conversation. So yeah. Oh, thank you for clapping. Now here's Michael. Hello, everybody. This is Trip, and today we're with Michael Roos, who is um, the author of a whole bunch of books, including Darwinism as Religion and Meaning to Life, The Problem of War and On Purpose, uh, a philosopher who engages uh, science and religion and is a great storyteller and flat out entertaining. So buckle your nerdy safety belt because we're going to have some fun. So thank you for joining I think you can all, I like to be serious, but I think the most important times of being serious is when you are a little bit lightheaded. I think if you get, you know, bogged down and sepulchral and existential too quickly, then you you kind of lose a, a lot of the meaning of life, put it that way. <laughs> I I agree. I agree. I think um, that's one of the reasons I uh, I worry about so much online education because I don't know how you succeed in a philosophy class if you don't drink afterwards with everyone that's in it and attempt to articulate Plato. I know. So um, why, why don't we begin by you telling us the origin story of yourself as a scholar? What was it uh, in your in your life where you knew that you wanted to wrestle with humanity's biggest questions? Okay, that's a good question. And uh, since I like talking about myself, it's a perfect question for me. I remember... Once, when I was about 35, my father picked up one of my books and he said, you know, Michael, I like you, but you were a big head as a kid and you're a big head now. There are 35 references to I on this page. And dear God, he was right. Uh, So anyhow, I was born in 1940 in England. And of course, by that time, 
the war was what eight months old in England, and I was born in Birmingham, which is in the Midlands. And about three months after I bought, was born, the blitz started, and we were bombed out of the house. I don't know that we were under ever under any significant threat that way, but so I grew. But I grew up just outside Birmingham for the first thirteen years of my life. My father was a conscientious objector in the Second World War. I've never been quite sure why that was the case, but one thing was. His, he came from a family of professional soldiers, and his father had abandoned him and gone off to war in the First World War and never came back. And I have a feeling, given the fact that I've got huge Oedipal issues, that my father likewise had a fair number of Oedipal issues, and this was the way of giving his finger to his professional soldier father. Anyway, after the war, they joined the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, and I grew up in that very intensely. And I think I've been thinking about this. What what did it tell me? What did, what was being a Quaker all about? I think the first thing, obviously, is although Quakers are not at all literalistic about Genesis and that sort of thing, they're very literalistic about the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. So I grew up mm -hmm. with a great sense of obligation to fellow humans. I mean, I don't I don't mean that in a preachy way, but I do mean that in the sense that I don't think I could ever be a realtor unless it were you know working for some nco or you know or something like that um i the second thing is because quakerism has this rather peculiar attitude to the godhead it they're very much into mysticism mm -hmm. they're very much not into people who who look like you in a bed sheet sort of thing or, or me i'm you know with my gray hair in a bed sheet and i think the third thing was of course quakerism is doesn't have any creeds or anything like that and so there's a huge emphasis on thinking for yourself it doesn't mean to say that you were you were left just you know okay go out and think for yourself but you were taught to think for yourself and i think that was a major factor around the age of 20 that my religious beliefs kind of faded and uh i i like to joke that having had one headmaster in this this life i'm damned if i want another in the next life and i think there may be some truth to that but it's not the only thing uh and um I thought that by the time of 70, and I'm 78 now, I really thought that I would be getting back on side with the big fellow in the sky, you know, cover your options, as it were. And the funny thing is I find that after I've been 70, I am more comfortable with non-belief than I have ever been in the, uh, the whole of my life. Uh, I, 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 I want to say right now, I'm not an atheist in the new atheist sense. I'm not really an atheist in the Bertrand Russell sense. I'm an agnostic in the J.B.S. Haldane sense of this is this world is more peculiar than we think it is, and it's also more peculiar than we could ever think it is. And I'm inclined to think that. I mean, I think that there are ultimate mysteries about why is there something rather than nothing? Is there a purpose to it? Nature of consciousness and those things, which I just don't... I mean, philosophers have been at this for two, 3,000 years. Uh, I, there are days when I say, I'm not sure we've even scratched the surface. I mean, of course, we know an awful lot about the, the mind-body. We know about the brain. I mean, I'm not in any sense knocking that or the Big Bang Theory or anything like that. Because, I mean, these are wonderful. But do they speak to why is there something rather than nothing? I'm not sure they do. But anyhow, getting ahead of myself. I went to university to read mathematics and discovered on the second day that that was a bad mistake because I was a good high school mathematician, but just wasn't a university mathematician. And I found that I could, in, after the first year, switch into doing a joint degree in philosophy. And I think it was virtually on the first day that we did Descartes' meditations, I realized that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It, was, it really was like Saul on the road to Damascus, uh, that, you know, that was it. Uh, I, I went to graduate school in America. I didn't do very well. And I got a job in 1965 teaching philosophy. And once again, again, that kind of Saul on the road to Damascus experience, I realized that I was not only a gifted teacher, but that this was what I wanted to do. What now? And a, oh yeah, my wife's in the background. And my wife is saying, and a modest teacher too. <laughs> I grew up, you see, my father was a school bursar. My mother was a school teacher. 
And everybody would say, well, you're going to be a teacher, are you? And the thought of being a, a school teacher <laughs> horrified me then. It horrifies me now. But being a university teacher is, is a different sort of thing. I mean, you, first of all, you're not in class all the time. And secondly, you are dealing with people who are older who are not resenting or, you know, in the same kind of way being in the class. And of course, third, you can start to explore philosoph philosophical ideas. And as you say, have some humor and a bit of fun. Uh, a double entendres that you've got to be very careful about uh, at high school, although these days in universities you have to be careful too. So anyhow, th I did that. Now, I moved into, I, I got I to do a dissertation, as you call it in America, what they call, what they call a thesis in England. And I was a philosopher of science. I, in those days, things like ethics were pretty boring. You know, they were all meta-ethics and, you know, the meaning of things and that sort of thing. I mean, it wasn't until the 70s with the Vietnam War and the rise of feminism and, and uh, racial issues that philosophy, the, uh, philosophical ethics mm -hmm. became a lot more interesting. Uh, but certainly in the 60s, it was really about as dull as ditch water. And so I was a philosopher of science and looking for a dissertation topic. I mean, if you're looking for a dissertation topic, you want something that doesn't have too much literature and that which there is is pretty awful. Uh, I mean, there's no, I mean, that, you know, who's going to work on the problem of induction or Quine's analysis of the analytic synthetic distinction? There's been so much written on that that the thought of doing another dissertation on that and saying anything of interest. On the other hand, you know, something like, well, biology was only then coming into prominence thanks mm -hmm. to the, you know, the, the feedback from the DNA model. Uh, evolutionary biology in the 1960s was getting more exciting with models like Bill Hamilton's kin selection and those sorts of things. And so I, like two or three others, well, four or five, ten others, not a great number, uh, fixed on... Uh, on doing evil, uh, well, doing biology and evolutionary biology has the most obvious philosophical problems, and so that's what I wrote my dissertation on. That's what I wrote my first book on. But the other thing which was happening in the sixties, and the, the big thing in my field, of course, was Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just that Kuhn was offering a sort of an exciting uh, analysis of of science which wasn't, you know, just formal, but involved, you know, sociological factors and these sorts of things. But he was also saying, and I, and this, I think, was what struck me and others, some, some of you know, my cohort very strongly. He was saying that the most important thing for philosophers of science is to look at the history of the subject. That you, you, if you want to do good philosophy of science, you've got to do history of philosophy as, uh, history of philosophy mm -hmm. as well. Now, and for anybody working on evolutionary theory, you know, that's uh, calls to Newcastle. I mean, you're preaching to the converted because the whole thing about evolutionary theory is that you're dealing with the past. And so, I, actually, I went to Cambridge on my first sabbatical in 72, 73, and basically retooled as a historian. And I ended up writing my second book on the on the Darwinian revolution at the end of the uh, decade. And I, I kind of joke that in, in philosophy, I'm a very conservative, logical empiricist, logical positivist, but that in, in history, I'm a radical constructivist. And, you know, <laughs> any influence except science is what I'm looking for, you know, religion, politics, sexual uh, habits. I'm, I once found that... Uh, in, in his private notebooks that a very eminent evolutionist in the 19th century couldn't get erections in, except in the company of prostitutes. He thought that his experience at an English public school, private school, had made it impossible for him to relate socially or sexually to women of his own class. And he used to have to go to Paris to get his rocks off. Boy, did I ever bring that into my discussions about the nature of science, I can tell you. It, you know, it was a long way from Hempel and Nagel and those that I'd been, I'd been trained on. So anyhow, this was me in the 70s. And I was a bit, you know, even then I was a bit mixed on whether I wanted to move right over the history of science or whether I wanted to stay in philosophy of science. I mean, where I was teaching, my colleagues really didn't. I mean, I, I, it's one thing about being at a rather small new university. 
is that you have a lot more freedom about what you want to do than suppose I would. At the, I gather at the University of Michigan, the chair used to have in the philosophy department outside his office a list of the 10 most important journals ranked, you know, Philosophical Review, Journal of Philosophy. I, well, I didn't have that sort of thing. So I, I was under no pressure to publish in the Journal of Philosophy. If I wanted to go up and publish in you know, the newly founded studies in the history and philosophy of, 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 of science, I was, uh, I, I was perfectly free to do that. And I did that. And I published in church history. I mean, they were respectable journals, but they weren't necessarily philosophy journals. Mm -hmm. And I had a huge amount of freedom there. So this was me at the end of the 70s. And I think two things happened then particularly was one, the huge debate about sociobiology and E.O. Wilson and, the, and his critics like, like, uh, like uh, Dick Lewinton and, and Steve Gould and others like that. Well, I was blindsided being English and living in Canada because as we look back, we see that an awful lot of the attacks on Wilson, I don't mean that they were without substance, because I think a lot of them did have substance, but an awful lot was, on the one hand, people coming from a, a very left-wing perspective, having been radicalized in the Vietnam War. I think you know, mm -hmm. Dick Lewinton, you know, apparently in the early 60s, was a real you know, button-down, collar-and-tie guy. And by the end of the 60s, you know, he was working, you know, working... Uh, working man's shirts and, and and that sort of thing. I don't think I've ever seen him in a tie. Uh, so I think there was, on the one hand, there was this radicalization. And I think the other hand, and Ernst Meyer pointed out this, there was clearly a, an undertow of, of Judaism and Jewish threat. The 1960s, of course, was the time of the, uh, you know, of the, the war in, in Israel in 1967. And as you know, one of the things which happened after that was things like Holocaust studies became much bigger in America, as basically the Jews were whipping up, you know, support for Israel. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've got absolutely no, please understand, I've got no issues with that. In fact, I've got a son, a 26, who's taking a two-week course in Israel right now, which is clearly, you know, it's subsidized and it's clearly intended to give him a perspective, you know, a Jewish perspective on, on Israel. I've got, so I've got no issues with that. But it was clear that a lot of people like Dick Lewinton and Gould, I talked to Gould about this, uh, were you know, the whole idea of any kind of genetic determinism, genetic perspective on human beings, you know, went back to the, the 30s and to the Third Reich and that sort of thing. I, I don't think Wilson was into that at all. I mean, I think often he was naive. I think he was often misdirected. I think he was often careless. But, you know, I mean, the guy came from the South and he'd made much bigger strides than anybody, for instance, on issues to do with racial identity. So it was, you know, it was, but I got involved and got side, got side whacked on that because my fellow philosophers, uh, people like Elliot Sober, and were very much in the Lewinton camp. And so in a way, my reputation was taking something of a dive. But then at the same time, the creationism thing blew up. Mm -hmm. And. You know, we've had, what was it, uh, Genesis Flood published in 1961, was it? And nobody really took it seriously. But by the 70s, it was clear that the creationists weren't going to go away. and They were having a lot of success in pushing creationism as an equal to evolution in schools. But, you know, in the, particularly in the South, but obviously Pennsylvania shows, not just that. And, of course, this all came to a head in 1981. When, uh, the, when the state of Arkansas passed a law insisting on, quote, balanced treatment, end quote, meaning that in the high schools, if you taught evolution, you had also to teach Genesis. But of course, Genesis was supposed to be not Bible, but good science. And so there was a court case. And believe it or not, I, of all things, this chap from a small Canadian university, a Brit, was asked to be the, the philosophy representative for the ACLU. I mean, I was along people, with people like Francisco Ayala and Steve Gould, uh, who was the paleontologist. And I do want to say that for the next 20 years until he died, Steve Gould and I always had a very close and very warm relationship. I mean, we might differ over things, but it was always, you know, let's differ and then let's have a drink. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it really was 
the right kind of academic uh, relationship where you can disagree you know completely with somebody all day long and then go and have a drink at the end of the day mm -hmm. and you know chat about your family and that sort of thing. in fact funnily enough i found i was able to do this with the creationists i mean Dwayne gish i've got a copy of Dwayne gish's book evolution the fossils say no first edition to mike bruce with best wishes Dwayne. you know i i keep joking i keep hoping the creationists are true and darwin's wrong and think how much my book is going to be worth them but anyhow <laughs> so I, I was the witness for the aclu down there and of course we won and so uh, i was in a funny position my fellow philosophers didn't much care for me but the scientific community did and and the general public i mean I, yeah i got a guggenheim the next year and i've always felt in a way that this was the scientific community saying well thanks mike here's your reward i mean i think i would i think i, I merited it but mm -hmm. these things are such a crapshoot, you know, it's one in ten. And if you come from a, a small college in Canada, you're much less likely to get one than if you're at Harvard or Princeton or Chicago. So anyhow, I mean, I'm not, I mean, my wife says I am a big head. I suppose I am, but I, I'm also a, a somewhat cynical big head, let's put it that way. So I found myself in my mid mid in the mid 80s sort of you know very much drawn away from more analytic philosophy towards science science and religion those sorts of things we, uh, i did i mean working on creationism gets a bit boring after a while i mean it's very much it's politically important but mm -hmm. frankly i don't think creationists have much to say at an intellectual level i mean i think it's tremendously important to to think about them at a social historical level i think for instance ed larson's book on the scopes trial some of the God, summer of the gods which won a pulitzer prize i think is an absolutely seminal book and a great work of scholarship it's it's not analytic philosophy nor is it philosophy of science but i don't fault it for that it's doing something else mm -hmm. and the point is there, there just isn't that much in creationism to a attract you know, serious philosophical analysis. So I got much more involved, as I say, cr constructivism on the whole question of, because this was a big thing in the history of science now, uh, on the whole question of values in science. And of course, by that time, a lot of the historians of science were going right over to you know sociology you know rank subjectivism that the facts don't matter it's all a question or you know you can do anything with the facts whatsoever of course there were even some of course uh like steve fuller who defend creationism on that score and say well you know it's six of one and half of those of the other well i you know i'm enough of a philosopher to think that's total bullshit <laughs> and not only bullshit but it's dangerous bullshit i mean you know Karl Popper was a dreadfully insecure little man, and he, you know, I'm not sure he had a good philosophical thought in his life, but he stood for objectivity in the 30s and 40s and 50s when we needed people to stand for objectivity in science. And I've always had a huge respect for him. But, you know, he's one of my patron saints. I mean, I, I mean, analytic philosophers can't believe this because they run down Popper all the time. Like they, for me, Popper stood for something decent and worthwhile at a time when we needed people to stand for something decent and worthwhile. He will always have my respect for that. And so I, I was kind of torn on the one hand, as a, you know, I think a fairly professional history of, historian of science by then, I knew very well that social values did play a big role in science. I mean, you can't read The Origin of Species, for instance, without talking about Darwin's Anglican background, Episcopalian Church of mm -hmm. England background. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to, to talk about the sorts of things that Darwin talks about, about adaptation or the struggle for existence or division or tree of life. Uh, without, so on the one hand, clearly social factors are, are tremendously important. And yet on the other hand, I want to say Darwin's true <laughs> and, and Genesis taken literally is not. I mean, you know, I'm quite happy with metaphorical interpretation of Genesis. That's another matter. But I mean, Genesis taken literally, it just isn't true. We, the earth did not start 6,000 years ago. It was not created in, in six days. Humans were not created out of mud. I mean, you know, you keep going. They they did not fall because a snake told them, you know, to eat the apple. I mean, you know, those things are taken literally are false. So, and, and Darwinism is true. 
I mean, mm. even you, even you, as I look at you, your handsome features, I know you're growing a beard to conceal it, but even you are Simeon, even you are nothing but a modified ape. A mod oh, as Huxley said, better to be a modified monkey than a, modi a modified dirt or modified mud. So, you know, but I don't downplay you for that. I mean, I think in many respects, isn't it wonderful that you and I can have this kind of conversation that even my beloved Cam Terriers cannot have. I mean, you know, I, I, I ask myself, I have seriously asked myself, if I were on a boat and my late headmaster and my Cam Terrier were there and one had to go over the side, which one would it be? I, I'm inclined to think it would be my headmaster, but I, I don't think that Scruffy has got the intellectual abilities that even my late headmaster had. So, you know, I'm not being silly about this. So I decided to work on a big project on the whole concept to progress in biology, and I did for, for 10 years. And uh, I, you know, I published Bone Out to Man at the end of it, and I found it very, very satisfying. I mean, I, I went in with three, hypo well, two hypotheses. I, I, I like to call myself a naturalist in the philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. In other words, I like to see if I can come up with hypotheses that can be tested empirically. First hypothesis, which was the popular one by, by logical empiricists, people like Erna McMullen, was that science starts very much as a, with social values. But then over the years, these kind of get drained out more and more until today there are no social values. They're all epistemic because you can predict. And so evolutionary theory started with, with everybody thinking in terms of evolution working up to humans necessarily. And today, you know, we know thanks to natural selection, thanks to mutation, there is no direction. So that's the, the second hypothesis, one which I had as a constructivist, is that people still have social values, but today no intellectual would believe in progress. I mean, how could you believe in progress in a world which has global warming, which has the atomic bomb, which has Ebola, which had AIDS, and, uh, you know, of course today, which has Donald Trump. But, I mean, who could, well, in those days, Ronald Reagan. I mean, you know, really, uh, so I thought that basically evolutionists were not talking about progress because they were anti-progress. Well, I found both of these quite wrong, that evolutionists, I mean, they're all like Ed Wilson, even Steve Gould, they all believe in progress. I would get them on tape, and the first half of the tape, and you're probably hoping for this with me, the first half of the tape, as they'd be de denying progress, and then they'd relax and stop noting that the tape was going round, and they'd say, well, you know, frankly, Mike, don't tell anybody, but, you know, we humans are pretty special. It didn't happen just by chance, you know. No, 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 no. I, you know, I mean, they all believe in progress. So my third thing, which I found out going to the archives and talking to them, was they believe in progress, but they recognize talking about progress in today's modern science is not something that's going to get you grants and that sort of thing, and the physicists are going to look down on you if you just touting social values. So they, they they keep these for their popular writings or for their presidential addresses when everybody's, you know, had a good meal, a fair amount to drink, and everybody, as it were, the doors are shut. And now they can say, well, of course, folks, we all believe in progress and we're the top. <laughs> you know, that's why we're here, sort of thing. And so that I mean it was as I say, this was what I like to call naturalist philosophy of science. It was very, very re very, very rewarding to do this, uh, to you know, have some empirical hypotheses and then go out and test them. I mean, I, I didn't do experimental work and I'm not, you know, I'm not a social scientist, so a skilled at doing interviews and, you know, being knowing all about this. I, you know, it was very much a hit and miss process. But I, you know, after a year of going around interviewing 30 or 40 evolutionists, I had a fair idea of what was going on. I mean, I don't mean that, you know, maybe I was asking loaded questions or I wasn't asking the right question. But, you know, the pattern started to emerge after about 10 or so interviews. And by the time I got to interview 30, if it didn't happen, I wanted to know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that was very satisfying. But at the same time, <clears throat> I was now starting, you know, philosophy kept tugging at me. And the whole question of science and religion did start to tug at me, because thanks to the creationism movement, a number of liberal Christians, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Unitarians, 
particularly from the Boston area, got in, got in touch with me and I joined their group called the Institute on Religion and an Age of Science. And they have a, a, an annual meeting at Star Island off the coast of New Hampshire every year. And for 20 years, I used to go regularly. Since I've been down here with the kids, I've gone less often. But and the other thing is so many of my old friends are now either dead or retired. So it's not the group I was friendly with, you know, for 20 years. And that meant, I mean, it wasn't, it was very much like going back to Quakerism. There was no, I, no pressure on me whatsoever to start believing or anything like that. But I was able to have the kind of discussions that I'd had as a child with people about these sorts of things where, you know, as so often happens in philosophical circles, you, you know, you sneer about God in the first five minutes of the conversation and then it takes off from there. And these were people, most of whom were in fact practicing Christians, but certainly not, you know, big on Genesis. But we could talk about things like original sin because a lot of them were either Lutherans or, you know, from the Augustinian tradition, who did take original sin very seriously. And I, you know, I got interested in things like war and the extent to which war is an inevitable aspect of humankind or can we outgrow it and uh, and these sorts of things. And of course, there were all sorts of interesting questions like that. So I ended up in 1961 writing my little book, Can a Darwinian Be a Christian?, which, you know, there, I criticize, there are things I wouldn't say now that I say in that book and other things I would say. But I feel pretty pleased about that because, as I said at the beginning of the book, I wanted to write a book about the science-religion relationship where I was taking the science seriously. And I had a feeling that my good Christian friends, most of whom were not, in fact, uh, creationists or anything like that, but that they were certainly looking towards warm and friendly, fuzzy science to bolster their positions. And that something like Steve Gould's, uh, I'm sorry, Richard Dawkins' selfish genes put their, you know, made them feel very uncomfortable, that they wanted a more holistic view or something along, you know, a, as I say, a, a fuzzier position and that sort of thing. And I felt there was an awful lot of that going on in these science religion discussions. Now, you know, I'm a pretty, you know, pretty hardline reductionist in many respects and that sort of thing. So I thought what we really need is a book which is empathetic, not necessarily believing, but which is empathetic to Christianity, does not think that somebody, because somebody's a Christian, they're weak or, or, um, or, or stupid or cowards or overweight or whatever it might be, that, uh, that these, are, these are worthwhile intellectuals. But at the same time, I wanted to come in with a, a, let's say, a Richard Dawkins perspective on evolution and those sorts of issues. In other words, fairly hard line, you know, at that sort of level. And can the two be brought together in some kind of fruitful way? And my wife says I'm big headed. And I guess that's true because I felt, you know, I was lucky. I was in that position to be able to do that. And I found that there was a huge amount of you know, really worthwhile things to talk about, like free will, uh, life on other planets, uh, uh, you know, progress or not towards humans, a lot of those sorts of issues, uh, the problem of evil, those sort of things. I thought, you know, Christians ought to be a lot less scared of modern science, even the nice Christians, than than. They are. You know, today, so many of my Christian friends are into epigenetics or something like that, feeling that this means that natural selection is nothing like as powerful. Well, maybe natural selection isn't as powerful, but let's show natural selection isn't as powerful because it doesn't fit the facts rather than because it fits in with fuzzy philosophies. And of course, I like to point out that, the, and I'm not the first to do this, the biggest holists anti reductionists of the 20th century were the National Socialists, you know, Ein, Ein Reich, Ein, Ein Falk, Ein Führer. I mean, if that isn't holistic, and of course, Anne Harrington has shown that it's not only holistic, but it comes from the same sources that, you know, all these people, I mean, it's German romanticism right down the line. And if you look at the origins of National Socialist, National Socialist ideology, you see huge inputs 
of this kind of holistic thinking coming out of German romanticism. I mean, please understand, I'm not, because it comes out of German romanticism, I don't think that makes German, German romanticism a bad thing or an evil thing or anything like that. But it does, I think, mean uh, that you've got to be very careful about saying, oh, well, let's go holistic, because I don't see holism a priori as a good thing. It can be. I think it can be, of course. I think often you're in ecology, obviously, at certain levels, unless you think in terms of wholes rather than parts, you're not going to do ecology. The whole point about ecology is you are going to think about what happens if you have global warming on the pine trees, which affects the insects, which affects the soil, which affects the air quality. You know, mm -hmm. If that isn't holism, I don't know what is. But it doesn't mean to say you're going to have a fuzzy holism. So as I say, that's where I was led through through the the sixth through the first part of this uh, this uh, century. <clears throat> but then, and again, it was something which really I mean, all of it's a, very much a sort of an evolutionary coming out of things. The big project I've worked on, particularly for, say for the last ten years, is the feeling that an awful lot and this was sparked a lot by the new atheists, not so much their thinking, but their passion and the reactions that they evoked. And it became clear to me that the new atheists, for all their denials, were just as much in the religion business as mm -hmm. Dwayne T. Gish was or Philip Johnson or the, the creationists. I mean, they would deny this, but they're, they're equally trying to offer us world pictures which give us morality, which gives us meaning, which gives us a, a sense of where we are, uh, which is clearly, I mean, if you read The God Delusion, that's exactly what Dawkins is trying to, to do, is give us a world picture which is an alternative to Christian, what he takes to be the Christian world picture. And so I've written several books, and most recently, one on literature and one on war, which are on literature but on war. But their underlying theme is that this shows that Darwinism functions as a religion rather than, I mean, it, it is a science. I mean, what goes on in the biology department here at FSU or at Harvard or wherever is science, just as much as what goes on in the physics department. But what goes on in the God delusion or what goes on in you know the skeptical inquirer what goes on you know in a, a, an awful lot of these things when richard dawkins is debating the archbishop of canterbury and that sort of thing i think that what we're seeing is a if you like to call it a secular religion or secular religious perspective or something like of course a lot of them are quite open about this thomas henry huxley always said that julian huxley wrote a book called religion without revelation and ed wilson is absolutely open and you know, just read what is it uh, on human nature? I mean, he's absolutely mm -hmm. open that what he's trying to do is offer a secular humanist alternative to cr the Christianity of his childhood. And he wrote a, a more recent book, you know, just on this. And uh, you know, he's quite explicit. He says, you know, you are Christians who are creationists, believe in six days. He says, I'm a secular humanist. I mean, who 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 uses Darwinism as his his mainframe. So that's where I'm at at the moment. You know talking about meaning of life, you know, at 78, I'm sure I'm going to run out of steam soon, but there you go. You've, you've got me while I'm still alive. Anyhow, how's that? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you're still alive. And uh, one, of the, one of the questions that I, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on is having been engaged in kind of the public intellectual uh, vocation and in the classroom, as a philosopher, what are the things practitioners of science and practitioners, uh, religious practitioners, could really benefit from some philosophical advice? Well, I think they could. I think you've got to be careful about this. I don't think going in and doing a job on either on biologists or, or religious people is quite is particularly productive or particularly needed. And, uh, you know, I Quite frankly, I don't think anything I say to Richard Dawkins is going to change his mind any more than anything I say to Philip Johnson or uh, um, some of the others like that. Uh, uh, Michael Behe are going to change their minds. I mean, one of the reasons, though, that I like to do things like this is, I mean, I'm an educator. I mean, I'm a teacher. 
And oh, uh, I don't think teaching is indoctrination, but I think teaching is trying to explain things to younger people usually, not necessarily. I mean, in my early years, I mean, I taught a lot of older people, less so now, obviously. Uh, but you're trying to explain things to younger people, lay out the options, uh, all of these sorts of things. I mean, nobody's going to be entirely disinterested. I mean, if I'm going to talk about, let's say, the 1930s, and let's say Churchill on the one hand, and the pacifists, uh, the moral rearmament people, and the Third Reich on the other hand, and, and Mussolini and Stalin. I, you know, I'm obviously not going to be disinterested in saying, well, you know, Churchill and and the Third Reich, you know, Nazi ideology are, are equal. It's just the one one out, or it's up to you to decide on which one you want to go with. I mean, of course it is. But I don't think I'm going to be very happy if I present it all in such a fashion that a kid could just as easily end up as a committed national socialist mm -hmm. as they could end up committed as a, you know, a, a, an ardent Churchillian. On the other hand, given Churchill's view on the empire, I'm not sure I want them to end up that way either, particularly. But you know what I mean. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I look, but I do look upon teaching as a very important aspect of, of what I do. Uh, the, the Quakerism, I mean, you know, quite openly, I mean, the Quakerism. And uh, I, so I welcome opportunities doing things like this with you. Uh, my wife says I'm a big head because I like showing off. Uh, obviously, that's always an element, but it's not the real element. Um, I, You know, it's because uh, I think that I can perhaps reach out to, as you said, a group of academics, a group of non-specialists, maybe, you know, I hope some younger people will watch this and say, you know, he's got a point. I mean, I'm just, you know, I, I think our minister, I like our minister at our Presbyterian church, but, you know, he is a bit hard line on some of these things. And, you know, he, he's almost in favor of the wall. Now, maybe I'm going to end up in favor of the wall, or at least I'm going to end up further to the right than Roos on immigration. But let's think a little bit more about this. Let's think about what it means to, to be a Christian, you know, um, what Jesus told us about, you know, the, the Good Samaritan, for instance. Uh, I mean, the whole thing about the Good Samaritan is that he was reaching out to somebody who was not of his own religion mm -hmm. and reaching out to a stranger who was in need. And if I can, you know, I don't want to convert them to my form of Christianity, but I do want them to be able to think a bit more for themselves and maybe not just go along with what their dad's saying or their mom's saying, which of course is, you know, which is what we do and which is perfectly okay. I mean, I, I don't suppose to the end of my life, I will think food's much better if it has HP brown salt all over it, which I love, you know, for my parents. I mean, as my wife says, there's nothing objective about that at all. But so I, I can live with that, but I don't want to live with some of the views. I mean, there was no doubt when I was growing up, even my good Quaker, well, my father was clearly at some level homophobic. I mean, by, by those standards back in the 50s, he was anything but. He certainly did not think that homosexuals should go to prison. He, th he thought, as we all did, that they were sick. But, he, you know, he was not beyond talking about pansies or uh, certainly very much hoping that none of his children are gay. Now, I've got a gay son. You know, I'd moved on at a certain level to the 80s and 90s. You know, I mean, it was at a certain level was neither here nor there. You might say, well, you've got two other sons and two other daughters. And that's true. But it wasn't just that. I mean, if my only child were gay, I don't think I would, you know, leave my money to Battersea Dogs Home. I mean, I do that anyway because I'm such a dog lover, but that's another matter. So, well, when you when you took the kind of turn in your career to looking at the history of the concepts you're investigating and not just kind of the contemporary discussion, um, how do you hear some of the present conversations around science, like, say, Steven Pinker's book on, like, uh, Enlightenment Now, and uh, it, he gives a, uh, well, I would say, a not wonderfully accurate uh, description of the Enlightenment and reason. And then this beautiful picture of progress and this direction to Western culture. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, at a certain level, 
I'm a person of the Enlightenment. I mean, I, you know, I respect people like Adam Smith or people like Voltaire, uh, David Hume, above all, Immanuel Kant. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I respect these people hugely. And I think that, you know, it's thanks to these people that we live in the world that we do today. I, I recognize also there were other aspects of Enlightenment times, like the, the Methodism and that sort of thing. And of course, you know, these are neither just here, you know, one or the other, black or white. I mean, it's clear, for instance, that Kant was deeply, deeply influenced by his pietistic background, which, of course, pietism was a hugely influence on, on John Wesley, for instance, the mm-hmm. part you know, had a huge influx or input into Methodism. So, I, as I say, I don't see these things as, you know, either or, but not bl- not both or black or white. But clearly, at some level, I'm with, you know, rash- rationality rather than I- irrationalism. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, you know, one of, the, one of the things I think that we've always got to fight is, is ignorance or the power of ignorance or the feeling that, oh, well, I'm just an ordinary person with common sense. I know better than you, overeducated, whatever. And we, of course, we see the huge tragedy today with Trump. It's not a question of Trump holding views which are different from me. It's just that he's holding views which are based on emotion, based on ignorance. You know, to a certain extent, he, well, not to a certain extent, he makes a huge thing about his ignorance. I'm a genius. I don't need to read position papers. I don't need to, you know, I can watch I can watch Fox television all morning and sit down in a cabinet meeting at one o'clock and be just as well informed as Obama or, or even George W. Bush, who spent the whole morning listening to advisors, reading position papers, uh, these sorts of things. But I, I, that, that I, I, I'm so completely against that, like I'm against pseudo-medicine. I mean, I've got, I've got my relative, my father married a German woman, my stepmother, and she was into the Rudolf Steiner movement, the Waldorf school movement. Mm-hmm. And one of the things is they're anti-vaccination. My father, who couldn't see straight, you know, 20, 25 vision in one eye, 50 in the other, got measles when he was four. And yet, for the last 30 years of his life, he swore blind that getting measles was an essential part of childhood development. You know, I'm, I couldn't be more opposed to that kind of thinking. That, so at that level, I'm 100% with Pinker. And of course, in other respects, I'm with Pinker too. I mean, clearly, the kind of life I'm living now is so different from the life that my great-great-grandfather lived. Uh, in fact, I know what life I would be having if my great-great-grandfather were alive. I'd be a non-commissioned officer in India, because that's what my relatives all were, <laughs> you know, keeping the, keeping the darkies down uh, or, or in order, uh, that sort of thing. I, I don't mean that they didn't have a, a, a rewarding life, but I'd like to think that my life is a lot more rewarding because of things like availability of, of education. My father left school at 14. He was a very bright man, always resented that, always both proud of me and jealous of me to the, to the last days of his life. And I can understand that. So obviously, I think at one level, there's been progress. And if you read Nicholas Kristof uh, in his column this last week, you know, Christoph, who says, I spend all year, 364 days of the year, pointing out what's not going right with the world. But once a year, I like to say what is going right. He pointed out that uh, that a lot of diseases are being dealt with, that you know, some of the worst aspects of poverty are being dealt with, and those sorts of things. So at one level, I'm, I'm really quite empathetic to what Pinker says. It, it's clearly the case that it's a hell of a lot safer to walk around Tallahassee after dark than it would have been to walk around, let's say, London after dark 400 years ago. That's that's a fact. Uh, So clearly there's been progress. And I think there's been obviously been progress in science. I mean, again, just this morning in the Times, that that article about the new chess player, you know, computer chess player, which you know could you know take could take deep blue, the, the miracle you know uh, invent a machine of 20 years ago, but deep blue probably couldn't even draw against it, let alone win against it. So clearly, there's been huge progress. And as the the article says, this opens up all sorts of exciting prospects, for instance, for dealing with strokes, that you can just, you've got somebody in, 
They've, they've, they've got these symptoms. Don't ask the doctor. Feed it into the machine and get your answer back you know, three seconds later. And you're probably nine times out of ten safer with what the machine tells you. So obviously there's progress. On the other hand, I have to say this. I, I came into consciousness when I in the mid fifties when Eisenhower was president, and I'm you know going out of consciousness in in the late you know teens. I'm gone yet. When Trump is president, you know not all change is progress. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, it's not just Trump, is it? I mean, but you know, in the fifties, people said, "Oh, Eisenhower, he's an old funny duddy." And of course, when when Kennedy came in, I can remember the huge enthusiasm for this young, handsome, uh, beautiful wife, you know, uh, young president. I mean, that was what it made his death so awful. And yet, we look back on Eisenhower and even and dollars, and we say, "Well, you know, Eisenhower." We had a safe pair of hands there, and Eisenhower did stand up for racial integration and issues like that. So we were, if you look at it in those post-war years, we were in pretty good hands, all, all told. I mean, lots of controversy, for instance, about Truman and the, and the bomb. But even so, we were in pretty good hands with those people in a way that I don't think we are at the moment. I mean, God forbid. Uh, Look at the, 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 the another, I, mean, I don't get all, everything out of the New York Times, but you catch me 10 minutes after I've just put it down. But you read this front page thing about all these guards, prison guards in Mariana, who all voted solidly for Trump. First of all, their homes are destroyed by Hurricane Michael. And now they have to go 700, what is it, seven hours away to work for two weeks in a prison in, in Alabama or Georgia. And the buggers are not being paid because if, because the, the pay is frozen. Well, yeah, you know, not all change is progress. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I think for for me, one of the things that I noticed uh, Pinker doing and, and happens a lot in the academy um, is this kind of essentialization of progress being just the domain of some type of secular rationality. When if you just think of the investment in medicine and education, things that make up a large portion of his book, um, there are people of faith, people that came out of religious traditions and things that are invested in education and medicine and the progress there, not for strictly rational reasons or people that don't see reason conflicting with their, um, you know, with with their faith tradition. And I and one of the things I've I, I've wondered in um, is if we're actually creating more issues than need to be there by uh, having public voices on behalf of religion versus science when uh, that they they uh, make it over partisan or over tribal. When well, I I'd agree with you there because if I think of my own state of Florida, which now has two Republican senators and a Republican governor as well as Republican House and Senate, I would. I, you know, I think if somebody could take a frozen snapshot of right now across Florida, I would think more religious people are pushing evangelical views of anti-evolution, anti-abortion, anti-global warming, and those sorts of things than publicly funded people at FSU who are pushing the other position. So. I, uh, I, 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 you're trying to suggest to me that what we've got is a lot of public intellectuals who are being financed by the state, who are pushing an ideology, if you like, which is, whether it's right or wrong, is deeply offensive uh, to uh, most people, and particularly to most Christians, and Probably, it, certainly if you read Pinker, probably it's not as well supported as, as they think it is. Then, I mean, I, 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 if that's the message you, you're giving us, then I think you're wrong. Because I think that we are, really are in a battle at the moment between, I don't know, good and bad, George and the Dragon or whatever it is. Uh, but and I, in a way, I don't want to cast these other people as evil because... Uh, I know a lot of Christians. I, even, I get on very well with evangelical Christians. I mean, I really do. I mean, I had one in my house last night for supper. And, you know, I mean, there are things that he does 
that I think are horrendous. He's got four children and then adopts two handicapped children from China. Well, yeah, but his older children now are in therapy because they're ha having trouble handling it. Now, yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's all very complex. So I'm not saying it's not complex. And I do think that Pinker is often, you know, simplified. I just wrote a review with, a, with a, one of my grad students of his book, his latest one, What Enlightenment Now? And we call it, we, our, our review is labeled Curate's Egg, you know, the, the cartoon of the curate at, at, at breakfast with his bishop. And the bishop says, oh, Mr. Smith, or whatever your name is, I fear that your egg is not very good. And the curate looks, doesn't like to say anything. He says, oh, no, my lord, I do assure you it's very good in parts. And I, that's what we said about Pinker's book. There are parts which we think are very good. Other mm -hmm. parts, for instance, the way he treats Nietzsche is, you know, is is lamentable. It's 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 Richard Dawkins' level of discussion. <laughs> Richard Dawkins on the ontological argument. So it it really is, you know, as I as I famously said, the God delusion makes me ashamed to be an atheist. Uh, uh, but uh, as I said. Um, I, uh, there's much in Pinker's book that I admire immensely. Of course, the other thing about Pinker is he confirms exactly what I was trying to say 20 years ago in Monad to Man, that evolutionists are, are to a person, ardent progressionists, <laughs> that they're all gung-ho on progress. And by God, if I, I only wish Pinker had been doing this 20 years ago when I was right, or, writing or finishing my book, because by God, he would have had a major section to himself. Oh, I, I, I definitely think you wouldn't have uh, taken 10 questions to get it out of him. Uh, no. <laughs> the, uh, you, one of the things that, um, that I, I, I was interested in what you think of is I mean, you mentioned your, your Quaker upbringing and that, that they get really hung up on the Sermon on the Mount. And like, how do you see the, the teachings of you know, nonviolence, love of enemy, and things like that when you think about that, the problem of war? and um, whether or not human beings can grow past it? Well, I, I think when I was a Quaker, I think like Kant, and Kant talked about a lot of these things, though he didn't go, he was not violently against war entirely, nor of Methodists, for instance. But so he wasn't, you know, he was not in the pacifist tradition of the Mennonites, the Amish, and of course what the Quakers were. I think that if I were still a Quaker, and I, you know, I, I got this as a child, I would be more inclined to put things in an eschatological context mm -hmm. and say that really and truly, you know, the, the death of Anne Frank is a great tragedy, but this is God's plan and God will put it right. And we, we shouldn't just think of these things in terms of this human life. We should think in terms of God's over purpose, overall purpose. And for whatever reason, God decided it was more important for Heinrich Himmler to have free will than for Anne Frank to avoid dying of typhoid in Bergen-Belsen. Of course, you know, these days, uh, not having this belief, these beliefs, uh, I'm not sure I buy into that. Mm -hmm. And so I myself would, I, as I say in my book on war at the end, I'm not a pacifist. I think, I think for instance, that the uh, Second World War had to be fought. I think that the whether or not it should have come about, to what extent the Versailles Treaty is to blame. I'm not sure it was to blame us. I mean, if you look at Brest-Litovsk, the treaty that the Germans drew up with the Russians, the Versailles Treaty is a piece of candy. So I, I don't buy into everything being the fault of the Versailles Treaty. But uh, whatever the reason, I think that by 1939, when Hitler was clearly marching into Poland, and he wasn't going to stop there, that I think he had to be stopped. I don't think there's any question about that. On the other hand, the First World War, I, I, you know, I, I hope I would have been a pacifist from day one, because I, I realized why it occurred. I think, you know, German expansion after unification, feeling hemmed in by France on the one hand and by the growing development of Russia on the other. I mean, I, I think there are reasons you can understand it. Mm -hmm. But it should not have been fought. And, uh, and you know, by 1916, I fought the churches very much for not getting up, you know, meeting in Sweden and crying blood and murder that this must be stopped. And, of course, what they did do was just, you know, both sides were preaching, you know, onward Christian soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, 
I mean, there's times. I mean, I think if I think if I'd not been imprisoned for you know conscientious objection in the First World War, I would feel deeply ashamed of myself. Now, I, you know, I might have joined the Friends Ambulance Unit. I, you know, I think that I think somebody who decided to do that. It, that's a perfectly honourable thing, and I think you could do that as a Christian. Uh, you'd have to make it clear that if you come across a wounded soldier, it, it, their nationality is not going to affect who, your willingness to help them. Mm-hmm. But I think you could do that. Uh, funnily enough, John Buchan, what is it? Uh, you know, Mr. Stanhurst has a, a very moving, although he's Minister of uh, agri- uh, Propaganda in England at the time, he had a very moving... Uh, picture of a conscientious objector who dies in the trenches and I, I he, he really he understands that in the second world war my father worked with prisoners of war and i think that was an honorable thing to do i think i think if you are a quaker i think it's honorable in a situation like that to say because of my background because of my whatever it is i don't think i could take up arms but i want to be right there on the front line in the ambulance unit I'd, you must not take my unwillingness to kill to be an unwillingness to take my risks as a you know for for the stake of what we're doing or as my father's case to work with prisoners of war and so relieve the burden on other people all the time. So you know I think these are all balanced. So I'm certainly not an out and out pacifist because as I say in part because I don't have the eschatological underpicking. But mm-hmm. I do. I mean as I say. <laughs> Because you don't do all of it doesn't follow that you should do none of it. And this is where I feel so strongly is Mm -hmm. that I do take, you know, things like, I mean, I take very seriously the parable of the talents. I think that if you're given talents, that you have an obligation to use them, whether or not God exists or not. I take very seriously things like the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't think it means that you should give everything you have to the poor and that your children should should suffer for that. As I was talking about this chap last night, my wife and I talked about it afterwards. And we were very troubled about the idea. Here's a man who has four children who were, I don't know, at the time, 16, 14, 10 and 8. And they set out deliberately to have two children with special needs from from China, one of whom was it has a bad leg a little girl with a bad leg and the other who is is a dwarf who's a boy of, of, of four foot six and now i can see times when you want to do that maybe if your children have grown up but at the same time my feeling is i don't think you're disobeying the sermon on the mount <laughs> by saying well i have special obligations to my children which I don't have to other people's children. Doesn't mean I have no obligations, but I think you should balance these things. And I'm not quite sure, in my mind, that he was balancing. I had a, you know, I would worry that I was trying to buy my own entrance into the kingdom of God at the expense of others. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, 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 you know, judge not lest ye be judged. I, in a way, I really don't want to judge him and his wife, partly because I don't know them well enough. I don't know the whole scenario, how it all worked, and I don't think, you know, I don't think you should make decisions, as it were, having watchbox news all the morning and then say, "Well, I've got the intuitive powers because I'm a genius to give you the answer." Uh, and I don't have, uh, even though I haven't watched Fox News all morning. Uh, but I, those are the sorts of things. But again, you know, Christianity, in some respects, isn't much help. Jesus says, who is my mother? Who are my, you know, <laughs> on one hand. And yet elsewhere in, in, in the, you know, the, the later the, the, the Gospels or the Acts or whatever, uh, or some of the epistles, we're told quite clearly that you have obligations to family and that, you know, <laughs> it would be quite wrong to walk out on your old parents and that sort of thing. And that, mm-hmm. I would say true. I mean, yeah, we should be worried about old people generally but if your mum you know your dad's just died your mum's you know rather frail she's always relied on your dad for doing not only bringing in the coal but for doing the finances and that sort of thing i think if you say well mum it's not my business uh, i've got other things to do i mean you're a shit <laughs> i mean you know i mean really I, I cannot believe that jesus christ would be a hundred percent in favor of what you're doing right then. <laughs> well, I mean, in, is, at least in the uh, to hell I will gladly go. <laughs> at least in the Gospel of John, he he arranges care for his mom from the cross. That's yeah, it. he does, doesn't he? I mean, and, yeah. you know, 
I mean, it's all so complex, isn't it? And that's the trouble with pulling anything just out of out of context like that and saying, well, here you are, this is what, you know. I mean, you can't do that. You've got to look at the overall perspective. Now, when when you think of the the problem of war and these different virtues and things, how does awareness and recognition that our biological structure has not evolved much since we started telling stories using symbols and building tribes and developing technology that can kill a planet. Like, how does the problem of war uh, and violence get reframed when you take our biological inheritance seriously? Well, I think that's a very good question. It's one I wrestle with in the book to a certain extent. And this is why I call myself a naturalist in philosophy, because I think at a certain level, good philosophy, and I mean, I'm, you know, I'm right here with, let's say, Aristotle, I couldn't be more, in, or, or Kant, to take you know, two of my great heroes. Uh, both of them would have said, well, you know, if you want to do any good philosophy, what's the science telling you? What's, what, what is the science telling you? And of course, the thing is, since the 1950s, and all that Robert Ardrey stuff, Conrad Lorenz stuff about the naked ape, you know, the killer ape at the beginning of 2001, I, you know, which was very popular in the 50s, that we are the, the, you know, the only apes without any kind of control, that if you look at the dogs, for instance, you know, when they're fighting, then the loser will turn over and a drop of urine will appear on its penis, and that turns off the killer. And, you know, because it's for the good of society and all of that sort of thing. I think you'd, you, what you would say if you were to, for, to talk to people like Franz de Waal and others like that, that an awful lot of this stuff about the naked ape just doesn't hold water. Uh, cl- clearly, we know that there is violence. I mean, Joan, uh, Joan Goodall showed us that amongst the chimpanzees, that there's clearly, if you follow the chimps around day in and day out for year after year, you're going to see violence that you don't don't see, you know, normally, just like if you walk down the street of Detroit, by and large, you don't see a mugging. But if you're a policeman, you know, on duty month after month, year after year in Detroit, you're probably going to see a hell of a lot. Um, so, as I say, the first thing I, I'm not convinced is that we humans are necessarily killer apes. I mean, I think it's clearly the fact, and we have to only have to look at ourselves, that we have gone more than almost any other animal in the direction of sociality, that the way that we work is by, you know, to, as Ben Franklin said, after they've signed the Declaration of Independence, well, gentlemen, we must all hang together, otherwise, assuredly, we will all hang separately. And the fact of the matter is we do. I mean, look at you. You're a really nice young man, a good, strong young man. But, you know, with all due respect, I wouldn't take you on, put money on you versus a, a rather pissed off gorilla if we put you both in the ring. That's a good, a good decision. A, a crocodile, let alone a, a, a tiger, let alone, you know, I mean, um, and so we keep going. I mean, I, I, I just wouldn't. Now, does that mean you're a wimp and a pansy, the kind of guy that Charles Atlas, the Charles Atlas adds, the guy kicks sand into your face? Well, possibly. But the simple fact of the matter is, by and large, you and your cohort are doing a hell of a lot better than chimpanzees, than gorillas, than tigers, than crocodiles. I mean, you know, even here in Florida, the poor old crocodiles are confined to one very small part of the Everglades. and They better not step out of that. So, but why is that? Because, well, because we have developed social things like memory, like being able to transmit uh, information without having to go through the genes, that you can ask me about things about my childhood. You don't have to wait until, as it were, a, a future Michael Roos is, is programmed to open his mouth and say these things, or you're programmed to know them before I even have to open my mouth, that we do this. And so we're incredibly social. And we've all, I mean, the thing I like, and this always goes down well with the undergraduates, as I say, imagine if, like most other mammals, we came into heat. Imagine in this class, if two, two members of this class were in heat. I mean, do you think that we could talk about the categorical imperative under those conditions? You know, we'd all be going, 
you know, let me get there first. I'm a full professor and you're just an undergrad, you know. Uh, so we've developed these social things which enable us to, to live as a group, to work together as a group, to do all these sorts of things. So I, I take the killer ape thing with a, not with a pinch of salt because it's more serious than that. But I do take it with a, let's say, Cartesian skepticism. And I, I, I'm fully prepared to accept what I think a lot, quite a few would argue. And I suspect Pinker would probably, I don't know where Pinker exactly stands on this, but I suspect he probably, that an awful lot of the violence and things started with the coming of things like agriculture. I mean, if mm -hmm. you're living in a hunter-gatherer society, obviously there's going to be raids and violence between others, particularly you're competing for territory and that sort of thing. But once you're in a situation where somebody's actually got material goods and can't move, in other words, you can't get up overnight and move 10 miles down the canyon, but you're stuck there with your, your veggies and your chickens, then I could see raiding and, and war and those sorts of things becoming much more as a viable reproductive strategy. And uh, so I, I mean, Pinker says, Agriculture got rid of war, but I've read others who say, no, agriculture was the cause of war. Now, clearly, these are empirical questions, and I'm not being a wimp in saying that these are not job, these are not questions for me, because I'm a philosopher. I don't want, you know, I mean, I don't mean I couldn't contribute to the discussion, but I'm not, certainly not going to do the anthropological studies and comparative studies or archaeological digs to see, you know, exactly when did agriculture come? Do we at that point see the development of new kinds of weapons? Uh, those sorts of things, weapons which move, let's say, from bows and arrows, uh, which would be good for hunting the local uh, wildlife to spears, let's say, which would be good for hunting the local humans and that sort of thing. So those are not, I mean, those are not my questions or my answers. It's for me to see what what they come up with. But as I say, I, do, I see this as, an in, as a collaborative sort of thing. So um, that's very much where I stand at the moment. And that's, that's what I talk about in the war book, as I say. I think, I think that there's some really exciting things to be thought about now with respect to war, its nature, its inevitability. And at a certain level, yeah, you know, it's easy to say we're just scratching at it because I think we're doing, we've done more than scratch at it. But I think we're now starting to get our heads in order to start to think about some of these things a little more constructively. And I like to think that, you know, there are increasing numbers of Christians who would say, yeah, we're not going to be hung up on Augustinian original sin. I mean, there are other alternatives like incarnation theory, which mm -hmm. is very much what Quakers, you know, Iranius of Lyons, Leon. Uh, uh, believed in that at some level Jesus is an example, an exemplar of what we should do. That it, his death on the cross was not to save us from the sin of Adam, but to show us what true unbounded love, the 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 lengths to which it's prepared to go. Mm -hmm. uh, that there are that it's Sophie Shaw dying on the guillotine. You know, it was part of the Red Cross group, the White Cross group, rather. White Rose group, I'll get it right in a moment, White Rose group. And, uh, you know, that Sophie, to me, is the total exemplification of, of, of the Christian, that she, she does this. She knows that basically being part of the White Rose group isn't going to make much difference to the course of the war. She knows that almost certainly she's going to get into deep trouble, almost certainly death at some point. And yet, bravely, she did it. And uh, she, I, I, that, that, to me, is the perfect exemplification of, of, of the Christian life. Uh, I mean, I don't think that Anne Frank was an exemplification of Christian life. It's just I don't think Christians should have done it to her. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think Anne Frank has many other virtues. I mean, the, the brilliance of her psychological perspe you know, perspectives and, and perceptions in her diary, I think, you know, is overwhelming. So uh, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not in any sense downplaying Anne Frank, but I don't see her death in quite the same light as I see Sophie Scholl's with Sophie consciously and deliberately 
sought a course of action which she knew would almost inevitably lead to death, but which she felt was the only way she could act as a Christian in the light of what her Lord, Lord had done. That, you know, I think if you've got a Christian who takes that kind of perspective, I think that <clears throat> I think an anthropologist or a primatologist and, and he or she have a lot to talk about and probably a lot to share. So, you know, it cuts both ways as far as I'm concerned. I mean, mm-hmm. Sophie Schultz was a human just as much as Heinrich Himmler was. So um, one of the one of the concepts you talked about in a meaning of life is Darwinian existentialism. So, <laughs> so if you if you were going to give a, a Darwinian existentialist revival sermon, and and, and give that. Well, I don't know that existentialists are very much into revival terms. I was just showing to my students uh, what is it the Sinclair Lewis thing. Uh, uh, Elmer Gantry, you know, that had revival tents. Uh, a, a movie which I have to say we all enjoyed immensely. And Gene Simmons and uh, and Burt Lancaster, I mean, he won the, the, the Oscar for that. Burt Lancaster, you know, he was a really, he really was a very good actor. They, they was wonderful. But I, I, I don't think that's the kind of uh, even secular alternative to Christianity I'm into. Uh, uh, although you might think of this program itself as the updated version, a TV version of a, a revival tent. Perhaps it is. Well, we aren't going to mail anything with oil on it. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm just waiting for the tambourines to come in at the background, you know, <laughs> like a Billy Graham thing. Who, who was the chap who used to do all the singing? Beverly Shells or <laughs> Beverly, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm just waiting for that to happen, you know. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know. Uh, no, I, first of all, when I say I'm a Darwinian existentialist, I do talk a bit about this because, because what Sartre wants to say is existentialists start from ground zero. And my whole point is we do not start from ground mm-hmm. zero. We start from human nature. But as I say, I don't think that Sartre seriously thought we started from ground zero. Certainly in Sartre's case, he started you know, completely from being a quintessential Frenchman, you know, with his drinking and smoking and sleeping with whip around and uh, all of and non-stop talking, as I say, in that Cartesian brilliance, irritating sort of way. So I don't think Sartre started from scratch. But I do think I agree very much with Sartre that we are not pawns of our fate, that even though I'm a compatibilist, I, I do believe in a genuine form of free will and that we do have choices to make and that uh, there are times when you have to make certain choices and be prepared to do these things. You have to say, no, I draw the line there or uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a go or something like that. As I say, I want to put it all in the social context. I want to say family. I want to say community, uh, and, and, and as it broadens out, and then I also want to say the arts, the way we think. I mean, you know, even I mean, look at what we're doing now, making a TV program. But it, it, you know, you couldn't be more social if you know if you tried. I mean, neither of us are a hermit sitting in the Egyptian desert contemplating the infinite. Here we are, you know, across the waves, but here we are, chatting away and talking away. I mean, if this isn't social, you know, it may be that you've cut the sound off at your end and, and the sight and say, this guy is so bloody boring. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's, put on some, let's put on some church music just <laughs> and then bring him back to say goodbye to us. But you know exactly what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So I want to say that our human nature is that we're social beings and that we have to make these existential choices. And I don't think they have to be the same for everybody. I think, let me put it this way. I think if at this stage of my life, if knowing that I'm going to die in the next five to 10 years, and I am, if I then said, I'm really too scared to face this on my own, I'm going to start going to church on Sunday. I think the Baptists look, you know, we've got a church just down the road, look like a good bet. And I'll get, you know, or I'll join the Catholic Church. We've got another one just down the road. And I'll become a Catholic and get absolution and everything like that. And I'd be told that when I die, you know, that it's that God's going to be waiting for me on the other side. I think for me, doing something like that would be what what does Sartre call it? Mauvais foi, bad faith. Mm-hmm. And I think that that would be, in some very real sense, denying the kind of person I am and what I truly am. Now, if I found in my 70s 
that you know writing these books and writing a book about meaning started to make me feel you know maybe i've just been a bit too quick with christianity maybe now i see the importance of faith as opposed to reason maybe you know i i ought to if i'd felt that i i i, I would be perfectly happy doing that but i'd have to do it because i was honest mm-hmm. not because i was shit scared of of dying and uh as I say, I think that's what being true to yourself is. I mean, it's the same, for instance, about, well, you know, about your kids. And they can be so tiring. And, God, you'd like to spend that bit of extra money on buying a new car for yourself. and uh, But your kid needs the money to, I mean, I've got one kid who's buying a house, needing mortgage money. I've got another kid who's an emergency medic taking a two-year course to upgrade him, so we're paying the rent. I've got a third kid in Israel. I had to pay his fare over. The Jews are paying it while he's there. Uh, yeah, if I, I think I would be false to myself if I didn't give them that money. I mean, I'm quite happy to say at a certain level, well, you've had a big enough suck of the tit, you know, move on. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally one does do that. Um, you know, our son at, 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 at law school has $63,000 a year law uh, scholarship. So we don't feel badly about telling him to take out a loan to pay your food bills. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a balance. But I Mm -hmm. think that being true to yourself and being true in your relationship with your spouse or your your significant other or whatever, these are all things about, you know, I mean, what do I say? You know, I mean, it's a question of who you are. My wife and I, my wife made the first cup of tea and she said, oh, I forgot to put the water on for the second cup. You get out of bed and do it. And then she said, oh, I can do it. And I said, no, it's my turn. You know, it's just so often. We live life not in Sophie Scholl situations. I mean, how many times have you been in the situation where you you need to escape from a German prison camp, you have vital information for the Allies, you know you can do it if you bribe one of the guards with chocolate from you know your care package. So on the one hand, utilitarian, you will alleviate, let's say, a hundred thousand deaths if you escape. On the other hand, you're going to corrupt a human being use it as a means to your end. So you're violating the categorical imperative. Well, by and large, we don't find ourselves in those situations. I mean, kid asks you to stay late later on to, to look at a paper. Well, on the one hand, you're doing some, it's going to make happiness all around. On the other hand, you're treating the person as an individual and not just as pain in the butt. Um, so these things coincide. And I do think that being true to yourself really is. And I, Maybe Donald Trump, I come back to him, is being true to himself. But I cannot believe that anybody becomes president of the United States of America and is true to themselves, who spends his morning watching Fox News, who will not read a position papers, who will not listen to advisors, who goes into these meetings, cutting them short, does all the talking and says, because I'm a genius, I have an intuitive understanding of what we should do. I mean... All I can say is if he's being true to himself, then he's not much of a, he's not much of a human being. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there um, you go. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, I think you're not the only person that's thought that. And, um, I, and maybe one, one, uh, one last question is as a, as a philosopher of science and having spent time wrestling with so many different questions, What's a question that you think is so good you wish you had uh, a, a, another 20 years to wrestle with? Well, I think the big questions like what is consciousness or why is there something rather than nothing are the really big questions. Uh, which uh, Is there a meaning to any of it? But I'm not sure that 20 years is going to solve it. I mean, my feeling is increasingly that these are questions to which – I don't know that anybody will ever get the answers. Maybe I'm wrong about something like consciousness. Maybe people will be able to put it together in a new paradigm. Of course, that's the genius of new paradigms, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, 200 years ago, a lot of people would said, we'll never be able to explain what life is. Life is just something. And yet, by and large, I think most biologists and most scientists would say, 
well, we, yeah, we know what life is. We can explain why things work and how they work. So uh, at a certain level, you know, I think that sometimes these fundamental questions can be answered. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not completely cynical about them. Um, what do I think is the most most important question? Well, you know, I don't know, 20 more years, but if I die, are there going to be new Mozart operas on the other side? I think that's, that's a question I would very much like answered. Because uh, if there aren't, I don't want to die. Uh, but um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, if, you know, I'm not really a big one. I mean, I'm a philosopher at a certain level. I'm not a big one on world peace or, or I mean, I am, but it's not something that I spend my time worrying about uh, uh, or, or, or the alleviation of poverty or those sorts of things. I mean, maybe that's, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's what's wrong. I mean, if I were going to live for another 20 years, I think the interesting question is, what am I, I mean, here we go ego all the way. What am I going to write in the next 20 years that I don't know I'm going to write about? Is it, I hope, something really different that I'm going to look back 20 years ago and say, I had no idea I was going to do this work, and I'm really proud. 20 years ago, I had no idea I was going to work on this Darwinism, this religion uh, thing in anything like the extent that I've done. And as I say, 20 years later, as I bring basically bring this project to an end, uh, I feel pretty good about what I've done. I mean, I haven't answered all the questions. I haven't looked at sociological issues or anything like that. But I've done what I can do with my my talents. So I suppose if you were to ask me, it would be what more what more am I going to be able to do? Uh, what's are there going to be jobs for for philosophy students, or should I think about you know re jigging or re whatever it is, so that. Uh, I mean, uh, as it is, I teach, you know, one of the things I push my students towards, particularly those doing MAs, is the possibility of museum work or teaching in private schools or, or, or anything. But I've got one who's now starting to think about looking for either government or NCO work in, in um, conservation. He's a big birder and that sort of thing. So I think that's obviously a question I'd like to know is, are we, is it, say, in five years' time, the governments are just simply going to say we're no longer going to fund philosophy as they're already doing in certain parts like Stephen Points in Wisconsin. Stephen, you know, are, are we just going to have to rethink about what we do with our teaching and how we do it? I don't know. But, you know, that's part of the excitement of being a human being. And I end my book with, with that poem from um, which says the lover of life you know, just grabs it. Uh, the the fear of life is so scared about what's going to happen that they can't really enjoy life now because they're, you know, they're, they're so worried about what's going to happen in the future. And I think the real lover of life is the one who, I, I'm taking my students in two months' time down to the Everglades on a philosophy of ecology course. Yeah, it'd be great fun. I'll take, you know, 10 students down there for two or three days. They'll have a great fun watching me try to canoe uh, you know, it, it, and they'll probably drink way more than they should, uh, and they'll stay in a hostel and I won't. It'll be great fun. You know, but that's what life is all about. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, thank you so much for hanging out on the internet and sharing about your life's work, and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, as Voltaire said, now let's go and dig our garden. <laughs> At the end of Canty. Now yeah, I just, we don't, on. as long as no one's had their butt removed. For, yeah, well, actually, my wife does most of the garden digging. I'm not really much of a gardener, but I do like it when she's done it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, right. well, it's really nice talking to you, and uh, I hope you can make something of it. Uh,